I'm Corey Astle. And I'm Kyle Simon. Welcome to Conservative Minds, a podcast about conservative ideas and thinkers. We explore what it means to call yourself a conservative, where conservatism has been, and where it's going. Each week, we select readings and conduct a discussion to share with your investigation. Join the discussion by liking us on Facebook or following us on Twitter at Cons Minds. That's at C-O-N-S-M-I-N-D-S. For episode 75, we read One Dimensional Man by Herbert Marcusa, published in 1964. Herbert Marcuse was born in 1898 in Berlin into a prominent Jewish family. After a stint in the German army in World War I, Marcuse joined an unsuccessful communist uprising in Germany in 1919. He was educated at the University of Berlin and the University of Freiburg, where he completed a PhD in philosophy in 1922. He published his first book in Germany in 1932, but the Nazis rise to power the following year led Marcuse to flee to Switzerland and then to the United States. He became a prominent member of the Institute for Social Research, commonly known as the Frankfurt School. During the Second World War, Marcuse worked for the American Office of Strategic Services, the predecessor to the CIA. After the war, he taught at Columbia, Harvard, Brandeis, and UC San Diego, during which time he became known as the father of the new left for his Marxist critique of Western capitalism. He died in 1979 at the age of 81. So the New Left is essentially the next stage of Marxist thinking, and so this book here is our next installment of reading the left from a conservative perspective. Herbert Marcuse is a, a Marxist thinker, and one of our listeners recommended this book to us. I've actually I actually read it many years ago, but one of our listeners who is apparently a Marxist thought this would be a good reading, so we took him up on it. So the Frankfurt School. A little bit of that. They, they originated at uh, Goethe University in Frankfurt. During the war, they immigrated to the United States. This is a group of German Marxist uh, thinkers, and uh, they had a, an overall critique of, of Marxism, basically that it hadn't quite worked. And so they were trying to figure out how to make it work. So these are the guys who developed the original kind of critical theory. We talked about this uh, on a previous book, Cynical Theories, but this is kind of an earlier stage of, of critical theory thinking, which to the Frankfurt School and to Marcusa is a social critique to affect social change, namely the, the Marxist revolution that hadn't come. And the central question that these guys had dealt with is really, you know, why hadn't Marx and his, his thinking, why, why hadn't his predictions come to pass? You know, why hadn't the pro pro proletariat taken up their swords and uh, taken consciousness, so to speak, and um, taken charge of the society and had the, the communist revolution? It didn't happen. And from their standpoint here, the Frankfurt School for Marcuse's probably wasn't going to happen. And they were trying to explain why and try to figure out why. And as a next step, try to figure out, well, can we push it along? You know, it didn't develop in the way that, uh, that Marx had predicted that that uh, communism would just be the next stage of capitalism. That's what the kind of the Marxist uh, ideology had predicted. That didn't happen. So it doesn't mean that the Marxist ideas were wrong, just that his predictions of the, the evolution and unveiling of history just didn't quite come to pass. They were trying to figure out why and trying to figure out a way that they could give it a push. And part of that was uh, a critique and uh, a deep dive into the, an understanding of so the, the base and superstructure of society and of capitalism in particular. And so they, they use new tools, which at the time were uh, very much in vogue. That's uh, like Freudian uh, psychoanalysis and also uh, uh, existentialist thought coming out of uh, Heidegger in particular. But this is also uh, contemporaneous with, uh, with Jean-Paul uh, Sartre. So there's a lot of that thinking in this book as well. So for Marcusa... This book is, is many things, but it's probably best known for its critique of consumerism and consu using consumerism as a tool for social control. He says, the prevailing technological rationality sells or imposes the social system as a whole. The products indoctrinate and manipulate. They promote a false consciousness, which is immune against its falsehood. He's talking about consu the consumer culture and buying more and more and more. It becomes a way of life. It's a good way of life, much better than before. And as a good way of life, it militates against qualitative change. 
Thus emerges a, a pattern of one-dimensional thought and behavior in which ideas, aspirations, and objectives that by their content transcend the established universe of discourse and action are either repelled or reduced in terms of this universe. This is his way of kind of describing, we'll get uh, deeper into this, that the consumer culture and the technological culture has had really just captured the minds of everyone and had become the new superstructure underlying society. And we couldn't see Pat, the, you know, humans could no longer see past it, particularly in America. And again, these guys were German, but they, they came to America and they had nothing but disdain for America, for, for marketing, for consumer culture, for the, the laid back kind of free spirit attitude of Americans. So what he means by one dimensional thought is really you're trapped kind of in this matrix of consumerism and being given more and more and more and your quality of life is going up. And as a result, you're never in a position to step back and say, wait, is this the truth? Is this the real? And so we'll get into this a little bit more, but then later in the book, and we'll talk about this too, he has a deep critique of, of reason and logic and as well as, as science. He's very critical of science. He says, society bars a whole type of oppositional operations behavior. The cunning of reason, right, that is rationality, works in the interest of the powers that be. And so he's, he's very critical of reason and, and rationality because he views it as a tool of those that are in power to maintain, maintain thought and social control. This is obviously something we talked about in uh, cynical theories as well. So he says, advanced society makes scientific and technological progress into an instrument of domination. And so this is kind of the, that's kind of an overview and we'll dive into some of the, some of the particulars. Yeah. And I, th I think the the historical situation of Marcusa and, and his fellow uh, Frankfurt school guys were, is, is important to understand. Like, like you, you, you said some of this already, but you know, there, there were, in 1848, Karl Marx comes out with the Communist Manifesto, and the idea in it is, this is what's coming. This is inevitable. This is the, the, the course of history is going to be revolution because of the horrible conditions that the proletariat's living in right now. You know, industrialization has made poor people's lives worse. This is, you know, this is going to end in revolution. So they wait around a while, uh, you know, this from 48 till almost, it was really 1917 when the Russian Revolution happens. And in 1919, there's a, the Spartacist revolution in Germany that, that Marcuse took part in. These guys are thinking, all right, here it is. You know, I mean, is, is there ever a population more ready for communism? You know, they've just been through the most destructive war in human history up to that point. Everything is falling apart. The empire is collapsing. You know, I mean, people have, they're just dealing with so much badness and, and, and just un, life is terrible. Here's the revolution. And most people didn't want it. Years go by, and I think they have to wonder, all right, where, if not now, when? Meanwhile, capitalist societies have adopted a lot of the things we call state social. you know, uh, Bismarck called it state socialism when he pioneered the idea of old age pensions. And we kind of copied that later on in our social security system and other systems. You know, they had, and, and Bismarck was no communist. He was a, a man of the aristocratic right, but he saw that this problem of uh, like people not having pensions was making people really angry and it was agitating society. So I said, all right, let's, we'll give them the pensions, you know, and that way they'll be happy. And I think that's kind of what went on across the West, you know, as a lot of these countries that were very laissez faire became a little more of a social welfare state. People calmed down, wages went up, you know, unions achieved their goals without revolution. They got, you know, more, more pay, better working conditions. All these things are good uh, for most people. I mean, this, this is what's so frustrating about reading Marcusa and people who think like him is that society got a lot better for, especially for the people at the bottom of society. You know, I mean, if you could compare working conditions, even in, you know, a, a factory or a coal mine today to what it was a hundred years before, you know, there's better pay, less danger, benefits, retirement. Not to mention all of the things that technological society offers us, the things that Marcuse seems to think are, are lulling us into, you know, I mean, he calls it a, a sense of slavery um, and unfreedom because we're all sort of just wrapped up in all of the good things society has brought us. 
And I think most people look at that and say, well, if society has brought us good things, then maybe this is a good society. Maybe this is, you know, not perfect, but it is a society that's getting better, a society that's doing better for its people, a government that's doing better for its people. Isn't that good? And I, But I think to the hardcore of, of the Marxist left, they're saying, well, this means there'll never be the revolution. And I think most of it is like, well, maybe we don't need it. You know, right. maybe the conditions that Marx was talking about no longer exist, at least not in the uh, developed world. So it's really, it's a, it's kind of a frustrating read because a lot of things he talks about, I'm saying, yeah, in a different book, these are presented as good things. Right. <laughs> um, but here it's, you know, he's talking about class warfare is diminishing because, you know, everyone is better off financially. Well, that's good, right? <laughs> But no, not not for him, because it means we're never going to overthrow the system, which he sees as inherently rotten, even as it's doing all of these pretty beneficial things for most people. Yeah, one of the main themes that kind of runs through the entire book is it's it's almost like you can tell that he's rooting against comfort in society. You know, it's uh, it's it's counter to his his greater goals that people are comfortable with their lives, their homes, their families, their stuff. His his critique of of consumerism, I mean, it it to me it has has real echoes with uh, more religious communities, for example, which obviously couldn't be more opposite than than these uh, like neo Marxist thinkers. But but kind of like consumer culture is taking you down paths that you know it's a distraction, it's amusement, it's uh, it's pulling you away from what's actually important, and it really feels like Marcusa is he's just rooting against. He wants people's lives. To, I mean, he doesn't come out and say it, but you can feel that he, he, he'd, he'd just as soon have everyone's lives be miserable so that they would have reason to stand up and fight and, and push back. And, and as you said, one of his, one of his other themes is um, freedom versus unfreedom. And for him, Americans at the time lived in a state, and of course, certainly now I'm sure it would be even more so, but live in a state of unfreedom because they're forced to seek the necessities. Uh, he uses this word necessities, which is essentially like you have to make a living. You know, you have to actually go to work. And and he finds that disdainful that that people would actually have to to do that on a on a daily basis, like go to work and get paid and in order to buy food. But it's uh, it's sort of like you know, food should be, I guess, provided for you. Yeah, <laughs> but, this uh, is this is one of the parts I read, and I thought. I must be misunderstanding this because there were, and you know, fair warning if you pick this up, there are a lot of parts of this book that you're going to have to read more than once. It's not, a, it's purposefully not read, written in readable language. And we'll get to that part later because he explains why that's necessary for this sort of philosophy. But as I read that, I thought, well, you know, is he said that that sort of life is not really a human life. It's an, it's an unreality and unfree life that you have to spend most of your day you know, earning the things that you need. And I don't know when has life ever been anything else except for a very few at the top. And even they, at some point in their family's history, had to get, had to work. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think to say that that's not a real human existence, I don't know where he thinks things are going to come from because he hates the technological society that's advancing all of these, you know, the, making all of these goods and things that we have through technology you know, with less labor required, with less of the especially dangerous and hard labor required. But where's stuff going to come from if we don't work for it? I mean, I guess it's, I mean, that's, I guess that's the Marxist thing. That eventually society will fall away and we'll all just do things for each other. You know, I mean, government will fall away and, and society will just, you know. Yeah. He says uh, economic freedom would mean freedom from the economy. From yeah. being controlled by economic forces and relationships, freedom from the daily struggle for existence, from earning a living, and uh, and a corollary, political freedom would mean liberation of the individual from politics. Intellectual freedom would mean the restoration of individual thought now absorbed by mass communication and indoctrination, abolition of public opinion altogether, with its makers. So, for him, we'll never be free so long as we have to actually go to work and. And what he calls a daily struggle for existence to earn a living, and uh, part of you is kind of like, well, that that does sound like a, a really inter a, a fanciful, you know, otherly other world. I mean, yeah. In the in, in real life, when have humans ever not needed to toil and to work? 
And of course, you and I have talked about this on many podcasts, like there's a real benefit to that, not just to gain your subsistence, but also psychologically and, you know, spiritually, there's just such great value to getting up and going to work and actually demonstrating your abilities and, and producing something in society or demonstrating a skill and sometimes being recognized for it or having value in the community and that sort of thing. And, and that's just completely ignored with, uh, with Mark Yuzo. Yeah. And also, I mean, it can, he hints that he's mostly talking about the, the capitalist West, but he must also be frustrated with the Soviets and their satellites because uh, yeah. people work there too, even sometimes under less free conditions than in the, in the West. You know, I mean, there was, people weren't, that, that, that change that Marx thought was going to happen and that his, this, his followers thought would happen never happened in the Soviet Union. It just, it was always the state controlling the industry. It never became the people doing it for themselves in, you know, voluntary socialism. And Marcuse says in, uh, in chapter two, he says, the slaves of developed industrial civilization are sublimated slaves, but they are slaves. For slavery is determined neither by obedience nor hardness of labor, but by the status of being a mere instrument and the reduction of man to the state of a thing. That's, that's an interesting thought, but I feel like every, every exchange of value kind of does that. You know, when you, when we buy something from that somebody else has made, we're not buying it from him as a whole person. We're just buying the stuff. We're buying the labor. We're buying, you know, I mean, maybe going right from Adam Smith to this was kind of wild, but you know, mm -hmm. just, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that reduces man to a thing. I don't know that when I work, I'm reduced to a thing. But the thing I produce is what the boss pays for, and it's what the people who the boss tells it to want. You know, I mean, that what else could it possibly be? Right. It's it's hard to get your head around. A lot of this is, but I can see kind of what he's saying, but it's just, and you know, maybe in my mind is not awakened enough, but it's it's a little too far out. I don't see how you get from here to there. Yeah. Well, I think one, there's one, there is one concept that I, that I think is intriguing and, and does make uh, a little bit of sense, maybe not in the way that he describes it, but uh, we have, has application and that is his, this concept of, uh, of false needs. He says the intensity, the satisfaction, and even the character of human needs beyond the biological level have always been preconditioned. A need depends on whether or not it can be seen as desirable and necessary for the prevailing societal institutions and interests. We may distinguish both true and false needs. False are those which are superimposed upon the individual particular social interests in his repression. So this is, this is an idea, as I say, that I think it has, real, has a real uh, mirror in kind of uh, more maybe religious thinking. Mm -hmm. That is uh, false gods or, you know, he's calling it false needs. This idea that, that society in particular, the, the consumerist ethos that in America just sort of creates needs that you didn't know you had and you probably yep. didn't have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is, uh, you know, you didn't need an iPhone until, until you were told you needed one. And, you know, whatever the gadget is or whatever the brand is, you know, you didn't know you need to wear those type of clothes until, until the society and the fashionistas and the, and the celebrities told you or showed you that that's what they were wearing and so forth. And, and I think, uh, I think he's really onto something. He says, most of the needs to relax, to have fun, to behave and consume in accordance with the advertisements, to love and hate what others love and hate belong to this category of false needs. No matter how much he identifies himself with them and finds himself in their satisfaction, they continue to be what they were from the beginning, products of a society whose dominant interests demand repression. Now he's he, he's going to take this to the, you're still in the matrix thing, but what are true and false needs, as long as they are kept incapable of being autonomous, as long as they are indoctrinated and manipulated, their answer to this question cannot be taken as their own. How can people who have been the object of effective and productive domination by themselves create the conditions of freedom? So, so on the one hand, I think this, this concept of false needs has, um, uh, has great application for our consumer society today. And I think, I think that is a really relevant, very thoughtful critique of, you know, where, where do our interests and where do our needs come from? Actually, you know, do I, do I need to wear this Nike shirt? I mean, why would I want it? I, I don't think as a society, we ever step back and say, well, why would we want it? Well, it's because of advertising. It's because of celebrities. It's because of Michael Jordan, you know, so mm -hmm. and so forth. And uh, he says that's imposed 
from from without. It's not something that that's created within. And so you have these false needs, which which is a form of unfreedom. And then uh, as as he's going he's going to go on to say that our entire society is made up of these type of preconditions and outside superimposed needs and thoughts and desires are not really our own, but they're created by by uh, the society, by the media, by the celebrities, by our consumers' culture. And, you know, he has different reasons for, for this, but he's calling for for people to step back and they're like, wake up and, you know, at least take note. And of course, in a religious context, you'd say, well, you need to take note because you need to put God first in your life or so forth. And mm-hmm. he's, he's saying you need to take, forth, uh, take note because you need to stand up and, you know, overthrow the you know, start the revolution, you know, overthrow the, the, the social control and so forth. <laughs> yeah. I, I did see some, there was something in here I, that made me think of, uh, Deneen's book too, when he talks about, well, just how, how, how capitalism, when it spreads, it assimilates everything it touches. And it does make yeah. that sameness everywhere. And yeah, real talk- quick. He says, uh, I love this line that I should have said this before. I'm sorry. The people recognize themselves in their commodities. They find their soul in their automobile, hi-fi set, split level home, kitchen equipment. You know, today we would say on Twitter, on your iPad, <laughs> on yeah. your uh, iPhone, you know, and everything. No, people definitely, I uh, mean, cars, there's always guys who identify themselves by their car. Yeah. That's, that's always been since the car was invented, I think. And before that, they probably were really into what kind of horse they rode, you know? I mean, it's just some, some people do like that and they really identify with a brand. Uh I I get the frustration with that. I I think it can be kind of gross too. I mean, I think capitalism does a lot of good things, but it's not a god, and it's you know, and the and the goods it produces are not idols to be worshipped. I think you know, there's definitely, I yeah, those were some of the passages in in this book that I felt, you know, like when we read Marx, there were sometimes he pointed out a problem, and I said, yeah, that is a real problem. And then he had the solution. Oh, I don't know about that, you know. But that's kind of where I was on some of these because it, it, it. I don't think it makes us unfree. I think it just numbs us to important things. Mm-hmm. And I maybe a lot of this is how you define words. And in philosophy, you know, we're trying to. He's talking about going behind the words, and, and you know, critical theory gets a lot into language and how it shapes the way we think, and that's so him saying unfree might not be the same way that everybody else in the world is saying unfree because, and as, as he acknowledges, it's not as though we're forced to buy these things. We're not in chains and, and, you know, made to buy bigger cars and bigger houses and various trinkets. Uh, yeah. But just the, the peer pressure, I guess, the, the weight of society's expectations. It's hard because nobody knows where that comes from. Everybody's trying to be an influencer these days on Instagram, but some of the things they're influencing are, are working and some aren't. And why is yeah, that? Yeah. You know, is it because of the person or is it because of the product? Is, is there some value to the product or is it all just fads? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, but I can see why a man who's serious about ideas uh, would feel, you know, frustrated looking out of the world saying, you know, the people won't have a revolution, but they'll buy this crap. This is crazy. Right, right, right. Um, so, yeah, I get it. it. Could There are a lot of critiques of liberalism from different sides. That So, remember the, when we were talking about the Communist Manifesto, we had this conversation about uh, alienation and alienated labor and and people just, you know, moving levers and doing the machines and, and it was mindless and, and in many cases difficult and taxing and but it's just kind of mentally like bankrupt or whatever but he he again he, we're trying he's trying to to give marx a makeover and so he updates this this term alienation from sort of the alienated labor to this alienation against the consumerism and, and society's imposed values he says individuals identify themselves with the existence which is imposed upon them and have it in their own development and satisfaction. And here's the real kicker, which I think is really interesting, actually. This identification is not illusion, but reality. The reality constitutes a more progressive stage of alienation, the subject swallowed up by its alienated existence. So you just ask the question, you know, where do these values or needs or, or desires come from? 
Mm. Do are, are is, is this something we just share ourselves, or are they is it imposed by some superstructure, or or is there a group of like privileged individuals who sit in a, a back room and decide like you know what uh, what which brands are going to be successful and so and so forth? But um, in any case, he says we find ourselves so deep in the matrix that the actual this illusion that's been created is has become the reality. And he says there is only one dimension. This is his bottom line, and it is everywhere and in all forms. The false consciousness of their rationality becomes the true consciousness. So, in other words, you know, he's he's kind of saying, why didn't the proletariat stand up uh, as Marx predicted and and throw off the oppressors? Well, because the oppressors turned around and created this consumer society, which actually. In in, increase their standard of living, improve their standard of living, and they were happy, but they were happy in their in their ignorance, right? I mean, it's just like the yeah. Matrix. Yeah. They're very they're happy and and find joy in their pure blissful ignorance, and that's how false consciousness has has fallen like a you know a dark cloud on the world, and that's why the proletariat didn't stand up and fight. <laughs> yeah, I always find that false consciousness argument very frustrating and you see it in smaller forms elsewhere you know in the sort of what's the matter with kansas type arguments of these people are voting against their interests why i know their interests they don't it's it's frustrating because i don't know how somebody could say that about millions of people maybe right. maybe they know their interests you know and maybe they like all this crap i don't know i mean it's it's very arrogant i mean but i mean i guess to write a book of philosophy requires a certain uh, well, the arrogance comes of because, yourself. sorry to cut you off, but I, the real arrogance comes because, because of his, his view of, you know, he's as a, as a, a watchman on the tower, he can see it and no, nobody else can. He says, slaves have been preconditioned to exist as slaves and be content in that role. This is what we've just been talking about. Liberation necessarily appears to come from without and from above. They must be forced to be free, must be shown the good road. My goodness, like who's going to show us the good road, right? Right. <laughs> who's going to force us to be free? I mean, here's the real fundamental difference between this is why we're reading this uh, as conservatives, reading a, a left wing book and, and giving our critique, because while I think he identifies some really interesting and, and, and very worthwhile points, um, you know, about consumer culture, about uh, where we obtain our values do we ever reflect on those values, where they come from, and why we think the way that we do, why, why we value what we do? I think those are all really interesting and important questions. But his his answer is not to kind of work through it and become more humble. His his answer is, those of us who are smart enough to have figured this out, we will be the guides, and we will force them to be free. We will pull them out of their unfreedom through through use of force. And that's the real difference maker. Yeah, it's 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 uh it's wild. I think Rousseau said something similar. Right. Uh, it's been a while since we read that, but it was it's interesting. I mean, he he just talks about he's calling everything a dictator. You know, the market's a dictator. You know, but I mean, nature's laws are dictatorial. Okay, you know, but I mean, at certain at a certain point, these aren't these aren't nobody's being forced into this. And that doesn't mean it's not a good decision to do other do to do something different you know it doesn't mean markets work the way they work it doesn't mean we have to you know place them above every other moral consideration but he seems to just it's the the, the sense of frustration does come through here and it's not an emotionally written work it's a it's dry but it you know you, you get what's behind all of this philosophy is a real frustration at people not caring about the things he thinks are transcendently important. You know, I mean, he says that our lives are not, you know, are contradictions and, you know, the society that we live in cannot exist. It, it's, it's irrational. It wouldn't, I wouldn't say irrational. I get tripped up on some of the philosophical language because he talks about reason, but then he talks about a different kind of reason. And yeah, yeah, it's and two reasons are in opposition to each other. It's quite a take. And it's, uh, I gotta say it's, it, it made me think, but it was also very frustrating to read. Yeah, yeah. So the so the unreason and the reason uh, juxtaposition, I think, comes through with his conversation about the dialectic, and uh, of course, this comes from Hegel, 
and was adopted by by Marx and and it's sort of the it's the advance advancing of history you know the as, uh, as history moves forward it has almost a consciousness you know the geist that uh, that propels things forward and the dialectic is kind of the opposites and contradictions coming together but he says dialectical logic is the rationality of contradiction of the opposition of forces tendencies elements which constitutes the movement of the real it's a living contradiction between essence and appearance the movement of things from that which they are not to that which they are so the dialectic for him well and and it's basically all marxists but these guys um these these guys take it up and and dialectic is still pretty in, in vogue with uh with the critical theories of today. And I think they did talk about that a little bit in cynical theory, not a ton, but mm -hmm. I mean, dialectic is, is, I mean, frankly, it's a, it's just a form of sophistry that sort of says rationality and reason and science are, they're not, they, they're incapable of capturing the real because he says scientific management and scientific division of labor vastly increase the productivity and created a higher standard of living, but at the same time, this rational enterprise produced a pattern of mind and behavior, which is which justified and absolved even the most destructive and oppressive features of the enterprise. Scientific, technical rationality and manipulation are welded together into new forms of social control. The quantification of nature's separated reality from all inherent ends, and consequently separated the true from the good, science from ethics. So I mean, there's a little bit of here that again I think that uh, religious communities would or folks would would agree with and say, well, science can teach us things, but it can't. It it's it's non-normative. It does. It can't tell us what's right and wrong. It can't tell us the right path or the wrong path. And so, I think in a religious context, you'd say only God and God's word and God's messengers can sort of like guide the way. He's going to go ahead and say here that that would probably work. He says, values may have a higher dignity moral, morally and spiritually, but they are not real and thus count less in the real business of life because the only way to rescue some abstract and harmless validity for them seems to be a metaphysical sanction. So that means uh, the word of God or natural law, things we've talked about before. But such sanction is not verifiable and is therefore not objective. <laughs> so he, right. he's so kind of he, like, that, that could work, but it's, since it's false, that's not going to work. But we still have to find a way to to capture and to, uh, to to be able to grasp what is true and real. And logic and rationality are not taking us there. Logic and rationality are taking us to this place of consumerism. It's taking us this this place of of uh, technology running our lives and to and supposedly uh, giving us uh, guidance as to how to live and what's right and wrong. But it's not really doing that. Those are all those are all imposed by the powers that be. So. We're actually, when we follow the science and the technology, what we're really doing is is following the breadcrumbs that have been laid by those who are already in power, and their plan is to retain their power, to keep their power. And so we have to get outside that. We can't. Some people might try to get outside that through divine or natural law, but that's fake, so that's not going to work. So the only way to do it is through this dialectic, which is this new form of thought where contradictions uh, come together. You have the thesis. And you have the antithesis, and those battle each other and combine into a new synthesis, and that there is the geist of history. That's the movement of history, and uh, that's going to take us to a higher plane, and that's what Marx had in mind. That's the reason he predicted what he did, and Marcuse hasn't abandoned that, that form of thinking. He just says that we just need to think harder about it and use it, uh, I guess, in a more pure and, and thoughtful form, and what's, what's amazing to me is, of course, dialectic Unlike logic, it doesn't. Two plus two doesn't equal four. Two plus two equals whatever the person who's <laughs> who's making the predictions, you know, whatever they hope for is sort of like the answer. It, does, so it really it, it is doesn't. It doesn't. It gets us nowhere. It doesn't lead anywhere, right? And that that's the when you see critical theory applied to things that matter, it, that's the problem. Is it doesn't go anywhere. It's a critique, but it has no alternate solution. And it's what you're saying. What you were saying really is interesting because it usually people who reject god and reject tradition are really into science you know i mean if you if you meet somebody who's very hardcore atheist and anti-traditionalist you know he he's often likely to 
believe, you know, believe in science, even almost treat science like a god. But Marcus doesn't like that either. And that's that's kind of hard. He's against God. He's against tradition. He's against science. He's against reason. There's not a lot left. And dialectic is, is not so much a thing as a process. And right, right. you can't really live by a process. There's no end. There's no result. There's just talk. And just I don't know, the rejection of science is, I mean, I, I, I agree with what you said. Science can teach us things, but it doesn't show us the right thing to do. It just gives us more information. But he sees the way, so he talks about how science dominates nature and sees that it just really leaps right to science dominates man and has them as sort of identical. But I don't, I don't see that as true in the course of history. I don't see that. I mean, so we have dominated nature with science. You know, we've built roads and airplanes and ships and all sorts of things to travel and, and extract nature's resources. But in most ways, these are freeing for man. You know, I mean, it's you're not stuck in one place anymore. You're not stuck only with the things that are around you. You know, the, the, the produce that grows in your town is not the limits of your diet. Right. You know, there's so many things that science and technology have brought us. That I don't, I don't, I mean, it's this, this, this cry for authenticity, it just feels so pompous. I don't know. This is sort of, you know, like, oh, these people are all into the same things because they're too stupid to realize that there are higher things. And then it seems like every old person who complains about they don't like the kind of music I like anymore, <laughs> you know, or like they don't write like I, the books I used to read or, you know, cars aren't what they used to be. It's just, it's the, the rhetoric of failure and, and of sort of sour grapes. Yeah. I don't doubt that it's sincerely meant and that he, you know, I'm not, I don't think it's cynical. It's just really sounds just defeatist and not useful yeah i mean i agree with that and i i I'm, i would definitely be open to to fans of the frankfurt school and i know there are lots and lots of them in the academy i mean to me <clears throat> what uh what they had to say in some ways can be summed up as like everything sucks <laughs> you know <laughs> like the, everything sucks not you know nothing's good you know nobody but um i do give him really some credit and uh, i i really find interesting this writing in that he's still identifying things that we've identified in in many of our conservative readings which is that there's an emptiness in society you know there's a there's uh, people are distracted with things that are not important or much less important and i think the again the consumerism i think there's uh definitely common cause with with the right on the the obsession with consumerism and even though we're much more pro market we don't necessarily blame the market for the consumerism. We would say probably say that's more of a human nature. You know, it's kind of like a mm -hmm. uh, a human shortfall is the you know the desire to follow the, the latest fashion or the flashy thing or the shiny object and that kind of thing, and is really not a function of capitalism at all. Except that through capitalism, I guess you have more access and more ways to um, present yourself, but. That to me is is really an argument against his authenticity argument because if you have more ability to choose, then potentially you could be even more authentic. Uh, of course, yeah. he would say that you're not actually choosing those those values are being imposed upon you from the outside. And of course, I think that that's always true, regardless. You know that uh, we we swim in the in this particular water, and uh, and that's that's what we understand and that's what we see. And uh, but I mean. So I do give him credit for kind of calling out like, hey, maybe some of the, the, the emptiness and vacuousness in society is really a function of, of these superimposed values that are false needs. Uh, I think that's right. But of course, his answer is we need to, to turn to Big Brother to sort of guide us along the way. Like he's figured it out. So all we need to do is turn to him and say, oh, you know, what do you think? Do you tell us what to do. You know, like, oh, great one. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, that's nonsense to us. Yeah, this is this is not a workable system because even in a American dictatorship, he would never be in charge. <laughs> right. <laughs> it would be somebody who catered to these stupid whims that he denounces. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's a great way to put it. Yeah.
Yeah, the populism that he's looking for, he wouldn't call it populism. He probably disdains populism, but essentially that's what it would be is like an uprising of of people who are thinking outside the box and willing to like push back or scream or, you know, throw tomatoes at the the establishment and so forth. And we've had a little bit of that in the last few years. And uh, I don't think Mark Yusuf would have liked it. <laughs> no. All right. What are your closing thoughts on Mark Yusuf? This is a frustrating book. I think it is difficult to read. And it's because, I mean, as he says, he says, critical analysis must associate itself from that which it strives to comprehend. The philosophic terms must be other than the ordinary ones in order to elucidate the full meaning of the latter. What he's saying is the stuff I'm talking about, I can't use regular words for because I'm describing regular things in an irregular way. <laughs> and yeah. that's hard to read. And it sometimes doesn't make sense even when you do read it. And, you know, I mean, I, I'd love to hear from some of our listeners because maybe I'm just too dense. But it, I, it, it felt like a Gnosticism. It felt like a lot of, you know, hidden meanings and, and then stuff that is there if you want to see it. But I don't think it's really there. I think most people know what they want. Most of us aren't too dumb. We just like some of the simple stuff. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't mean we've forgotten about alienation and that we feel perfectly at peace with the way society functions. But, you know, sometimes we just want to watch a movie, you know, and, you know, have some snacks. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I think he's, <laughs> he's expecting too much of people and, but also too little. I, th I think he thinks we're too dumb, but also that we should, be something other than we are yeah yeah and we should say there there are several chapters of linguistic analysis that we didn't really read mostly because it's mind-numbing and and maybe it's for people who are smarter than us probably but i think that's a little bit of the heidegger speaking like in order to stand outside and speak to the superstructure we have to stand outside it and create new words and it's kind of like okay but we don't know those words <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh anyway all right that's marcusa catch us next time